So you have to make a note uh, that the fact that to do these types of Coulomb's law problems in two dimensions, you need a distance triangle and a force triangle. We didn't need that last semester. But to, to use Coulomb's law with components, you need both the distance triangle and the force <coughs> triangle. You can figure out this hypotenuse here with the Pythagorean theorem. Then you can use inverse an inverse trig function to find one of the angles. And because these are similar triangles, that tells you the angle down here. And then we can use normal sine and cosine to find the to find the components. This is really a good review of the trigonometry that you first went over at the very start of the class. And now we know, uh, now we've specified both magnitude and direction here because we put in these signs. That would be a good way to describe this force over here. Also, remember I said there's actually two ways to describe this force. You, um, if you want to show, to describe it completely, you can break it into components or you can give the magnitude and the direction. And how would we describe the direction with an angle? Well, we actually figured out the angle too here. So we could also say that um, this, is a, this is a force of 1.26 times 10 to the 10, and that is making an angle of 37 degrees with the x-axis. So in some problems, all you would say is 1.26 times 10 to the 10, making an angle of 37 degrees with the x-axis. In other problems, it's more convenient to break this into components, but both of those approaches give you the same information. So if you had wanted to find this angle and not break it into components, you would still need these two triangles. You still need the distance triangle and the force triangle. So the thing to have in our notes is that if you're working with Coulomb's law in more than one dimension, you need both a distance triangle and a force triangle. Why is it so useful to work with components? Well. Now let's say there's a third charge, Q3, at this point. And now let's say the question is the net force on charge 1 from all charges. To save time, we won't go through this numerically, but we can talk through how we would figure this out. This is a very common type of test question, actually. How would we find the net force on charge 1 here from all the charges? That's right. Um, and then charge three, it would be the same method. Right. So let's talk through what that method would be. Um, in this case, we already have one of the components. We have the x component from the first time. Not really, because the you mean the x component of the force? No, that I was mean the x component from the distance at least. Ah, well, we knew that all along, that that was four meters, okay. So, um, I guess for the force, we would go through the same thing again, um, but yeah, so we would first have the distance triangle and find the legs on the uh, hypotenuse. And then with that, we can find one of the angles. And then uh, when we have one of the angles, we can use it as a force triangle to find the other components of the Good. triangle. Let's fill in a couple of details there, but that's good. So now we're going to need a whole new distance and force triangle. Now the distance triangle, now the two triangles would look like this, since they would represent this triangle down here. So now we have a new distance and force triangle. How long is this side uh, for the distance triangle? Um, two. Right, and this side is? So then we could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out this length over here. What's one of the reasons that we need to know this length? Where are we gonna, what are we going to do with this length? Um, we're going to use that to find the an angle. And what else are we going to do with this length? Use that to find the magnitude of the force. Yeah. The first thing we need to do is find this r and then plug that into this equation over here. And then what are we going to do with this number? Where is this number going to go in our triangles? The force. Um, it, that's going to be the force triangle. That's right. So this, remember, this formula gives us the overall force. So whatever number we got out of here, we would have to 
plug that in for this hypotenuse, and then we would figure out F2Y and F2X, and you already spelled out the details. We could figure out an angle in this triangle using uh, inverse uh, cosine or inverse tangent, then, then we could take that angle down here, and then we could break this vector into components. And of course, we'd have to remember to put in the signs. In fact, we might as well do that. Uh, what are going to be the signs? What's the direction of the force from Q3 on Q1? Let, let's draw that force vector into our picture. Because they're like charges, so they're going to repel. This is the force from charge three on this. And you correctly saw that that should be on the line that corrects the two charges. That should be along this line that, corrects the two, that connects the two charges. So what would be the, the signs on these components? What would, what, what would the x component be, positive or negative? Positive. And how about the y component? Positive. Yeah, in this case, both components would be positive, but it was still a good idea to put in those signs. And then we could figure out, uh, if we knew F2, we could use trig to figure out those components there. Okay, so we're not filling in all the details, but now in our imaginations, we know the components of the force from charge one, and we know the components of the force from charge two. We still haven't quite figured out the net force on charge one. How would we do that? Um, once we have both the forces, we add them together. And how would we add them? We would add their components. And this is the reason why it's so crucial to be able to break these into components. You can't add these two forces directly because they're not parallel. We can't just add the overall forces. That's what most people would try to do here. Most people would just try to cut some corners here and just plug into this equation. They would plug into this equation once for charge one, and they would plug into this equation once for charge three, and then they would just add or subtract those numbers. But the problem is much more difficult than that. Because these two forces are not parallel, they don't just add like that. Instead, you have to break them into components before you can add them, because you can add the x components, and you can add the y components, because those are parallel. This issue didn't come up in the first problems we were doing, because in those problems, everything was on a single axis. If everything's on the same axis, then you can add the forces, because they're all parallel. But if you're working in two dimensions, the forces won't be parallel, and you need to break them into components before you can add them. Um, once you... Actually, that doesn't make sense. Because I was going to say, if you add the x's, would you add the y components? That will give you the x components and the y components for the overall net force. So then could you find the overall net force by raising the divider? And then you could do more trig to do that. So then you would have one more triangle. You would have a triangle for the overall force. You would know the x component for the overall force, and you would know the y component for the overall force. And then you should be able to use trigonometry to find the angles in that triangle and the hypotenuse in that triangle. That, again, would be a very typical type question. For example, let's say that we got that this was the net force. If we got this was the net force, then this would be the overall net force. Uh, and we would have just figured out these two numbers. We would know these two numbers. Then we could use inverse tangent to find this angle. And we could use the Pythagorean theorem to find this side over here. So that's very common to have to both break things into components and then build them back up into the overall vectors. You can see these problems can take a lot of work. But actually, these, these are very typical uh, test-like questions. Uh, even though it seems like there's a lot of work involved, this is a pretty typical type of question. This is the whole usefulness of being able to break things into components. The usefulness of being able to break vectors into components is it allows you to add vectors that are not parallel to each other, because you can add the x components and you can add the y components. So again, the big mistake here is just trying to add the overall vectors. We can't do that. Instead, first we have to break those vectors into components. And when you add the components, it's crucial to include the signs. For example, the x components here, this x component would be positive, and this x component would be positive. That's why I said the x component overall would be positive. This y component would be positive, but this y component would be negative. So overall, it could go either way. I'm guessing that it was going to go down, because this charge is bigger than this charge. So I'm guessing that overall, we're going to be going down over here. But the only way to tell for sure is to plug in a positive number for this y component and a negative number here. Here's where it becomes really crucial that we put in all the signs. And that's another mistake that people tend to make. Make any sense? All right, well, there's a lot to that. Well, let's see if we can apply some of that in this practice problem.
Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, I guess we haven't done A yet, so let's do A. Notice that they want you to express your answer just in terms of variables here. Yeah. 